From Tops comes the all-new digital card collecting app, free to download from iTunes or Google Play, Star Wars Card Trader. For the first time ever, collect and trade everything from legendary 1977 Star Wars cards to new cards featuring exclusive content from Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. All from the comfort of your mobile devices, Star Wars Card Trader. These are the cards you're looking for. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z and Corey Club. The podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> yes. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. This is the podcast you're looking for. We've been waiting for you. The force is strong here, even stronger than the coffee. At last! Where have you been? Welcome to Coffee with Kenobi. Here are your hosts, Dan Z and Corey Club. Hi, this is Anthony Bresnikan, senior writer at Entertainment Weekly, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z and Corey Club. This is the podcast you're looking for. Coffee with Kenobi is delighted to have a cup of coffee with Entertainment Weekly's Anthony Bresnikan. He is a senior staff writer for the magazine, the writer of Brutal Youth, and a huge Star Wars fan. He hosted the opening ceremonies at Celebration Anaheim and has tremendous insights into our culture. We are honored to have him join us for this coffee chat. Welcome, Anthony. Well, it's great to be here. Yes, thank you. We are, we are big fans of yours. We, um, we first became uh, acquainted with your talents at Celebration Anaheim. So before we get to the present of what's going on in Star Wars, Let's look back at your Celebration Anaheim experience. We hosted the very first podcasting stage, but you hosted something much more poignant, opening ceremonies. Talk about that experience, both as a professional and as a fan. Uh, well, man, I was nervous as could be. And, uh, you know, the one regret I have is, uh, you know, as I came out to sort of start things off, I, you know, when I watch that video, I think, slow down, man. Like you're, <laughs> <laughs> I can just tell I'm, 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 I'm racing through, you know, the, uh, you know, the guidance I was given was you've got to go out and like introduce the event. You've got 6,000 people in this Anaheim auditorium. You've got who knows how many people watching online. Right before I went out, they were like, but you know, we're all these different countries mentioned that we're in like 30 countries or something like that. And, and, and literally as I was walking out, they're like, oh, by the way, China just came online. We just got permission to stream in China. So mention China specifically. That's a, that's a big thing. And I remember thinking like, damn, like if this goes bad, I can't even hide in China. <laughs> <laughs> What's going to happen to that's me? Right. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they said like, you got to make everybody feel warm and fuzzy and, and, you know, feel like, uh, you know, nostalgia and, and, uh, uh, you know, make this feel special and individual. That's why they asked me to do it because I had written some personal essays about Star Wars and what it meant to me and my family and my brother and friends and and, and you know that had connected with a, a lot of readers and and a couple of those readers were you know J.J. Abrams and Kathy Kennedy. So uh, you no know, big deal. Just little subscribers. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> about a year ago, I think you know, it might even be like. Yeah, almost exactly a year ago is when we found out the names of the characters, you know, mm-hmm. and I was privileged to to break that news because they had read some of the stuff that I'd written about the movie and about, uh, you know, I've been I've been doing this a, a long time. So I, I knew Kathy from some of the Steven Spielberg stories I'd done over the years. And I, I didn't know J.J., but he read a, a few of the pieces I did. And, uh, you know, I got a call from them one day and they were like, hey, you know, that trailer came out around Thanksgiving. Um, you know, we're going to be breaking revealing like who the characters are because at that point people were just <laughs> calling you know calling it the ball droid That's and right, uh, the soccer droid. you know yeah or the you know the the, the black stormtrooper like he has a name sure. you know and uh and and uh you know and then the and the girl on the desert speeder is is named ray so like they um you know they 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 told me the names we broke it with those kind of tops trading cards that he made up and um uh, you know, that was sort of the beginning of my relationship with uh, the filmmakers on The Force Awakens. And uh, it's been amazing fun. Uh, you know, that, that that led to celebration. And, uh, you know, they said, go out and say something. You know, this is why we're asking you to do this, because you're a reporter. You're, you know, I, I, they wanted somebody who would push them to answer the things that the fans wanted. 
even though they weren't willing to give away the whole store, you know, like (laughs) I was there because they, they felt like, you know, they, you know, they wanted to get the actors and, and, and JJ talking about the movie, you know, in a way that would be enlightening without being spoiler, spoilery. So, um, you know, go out, say something about what this means to you. So I did that. And I think there were some people who were just like, give us the trailer. Like they would have torn me apart if they could get that trailer 40 (laughs) minutes earlier. But, um, I, you know, I was nervous. I was really scared going out there because, uh, that's a lot of people. And these movies mean a whole lot to me, uh, as I know they do to everybody who was watching that. So I just hope I asked some questions that got, you know, that were, were some of the things they wanted to know. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really flattered that, you know, guys like you and, and many others have been, uh, you know, so cool and so nice and, uh, and enjoying the stories that I've been writing and, uh, Absolutely. uh, you know, I, I, you know, that's what this is all about. I'm, uh, I, I feel like kind of like the tour guide, you know, uh, I get to wa- raise my little lightsaber in the air and say, come on, follow me. Like, let's, let's go talk about, uh, you know, this movie and, 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 and what to expect. And, uh, I can tell you when I saw the film, even though I'm as deep into this as anybody can get as a, as a beat reporter covering star Wars, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I, 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 I didn't know where the story was going. So when I sat down to watch it, uh, I was just, I, I thrilled to be surprised. So, uh, That's you know, I was, gl- I was, I was glad it wasn't spoiled for me. And, and so that means, uh, uh, you know, all the little things that I've written over the past year, uh, they can't spoil it for you either. Although I do have some theories about oh. it. <laughs> we'll have to have what you back on after uh, we'll everyone has seen yeah. it. We'll, we'll talk some theories. Yeah. Well, you certainly, um, we'll borrow from another Disney icon with great power comes great responsibility. And you certainly carried the torch so well for us. I was in, um, uh, in there in Silver Shanghai when you came out and spoke. And I think the, the most fun besides the trailer was seeing your reaction when BB-8 literally rolled out onto the stage. Yeah, that was cool. You know, uh, so you saw like a bit of a shocked reaction? Yes. Well, I'll tell you why. I had seen that BB-8, so I wasn't like, I wasn't like uh, marveling so much at BB-8. What had happened was we brought out those two fellows who had built a lot of the astromech droids, right? Yes. But they didn't build BB-8. So we brought them out, and they they talked for a little bit, and then we brought out R2. And then I was supposed to dismiss them, you know, like, thank you for coming out, and have them return backstage. And then I was going to bring out, you know, we have another guest here, BB-8, because they didn't build BB-8. The You know, the creature shop built BB-8. And um, so, you know, give credit where it was due. We were going to let those two fellows go back, and then R2 and BB-8 were going to be there. But when I... I went to like, you know, thanks for being here, guys. They were like, oh, but, you know, don't you want to bring up BB-8? <laughs> I was like, okay, oh, yeah, sure. Like, we'll roll with this. Like, okay, we're bringing them out. And then I, I felt like that was I, was, I was just worried that I had made a big mistake. Uh, but sure. actually, like, oh, wait, no, sorry. I, I almost forgot, like, to bring BB-8 out. But uh, so I, I kind of was like, wait, wait. They were, I was just like sort of panicking. I had this moment of like, <gasps> Doing this up, but but actually, I mean, it just went fine. It was. Uh, I think everybody was so blown away to see that BB-8 was real. Uh, mm-hmm. That my little, like, uh, you know, uh, well, as an English, my little, writer. my little orchestration thing. I was worried about the choreography. You know, like sure. are we bringing the right people on and off? But it turned out to be fine. So. Timing, timing is everything. And, and as an English teacher, I appreciate that you said we're going to roll with it. I don't know if you even recognize the pun, but pretty great. <laughs> we're going to roll with it. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> was a, no pun intended. But, That's right. uh, but, so you, uh, yeah. You've definitely covered a lot of big events from the Marvel movies and the Oscars and, of course, Star Wars. So what makes the hype and energy for The Force Awakens so different? You know, that's a good question, and it's a hard one to answer. I don't think anybody really knows. Let's be honest. The original trilogy... You know, which everybody loves. There's debate about the prequels, and some people love them, and some people don't. But like sure. those aside, the original trilogy, there are flaws in those movies, right? They're not perfect movies. Right. Some of the acting is, you know, a little dubious. Some of the writing is too. Uh, there are plot holes galore. It doesn't entirely make sense, <laughs> and yet the love and affection for those stories is beyond any other film or book or television show that exists. So what is it that they're doing that is so meaningful to people? And 
I think it's because those movies, imperfect as they are, and I love them, you know, I'm not throwing shade at them. Sure. I'm just pointing out a fact. Like, imperfect as they are, we adore them. They mean so much. You know, they're, my street has Star Wars Christmas decorations out. You know, right. what does that have to do with Star Wars? It's just that something we love fused with something else that we love. And it made seeing that made gave me a little bit of insight uh, just recently about why these movies mean something. You know, we love all the holidays because it takes us back to when we were kids and happy, joyful times. And Star Wars is the same thing. It's uh, it takes us back to a really great time we had when we were young. If you're if you're, if you're a grown up like like we are, sure. And um, and this has been happening for kids for now forty years, right? Right. So, um, you know, if you're twenty, you also had a happy memories of seeing Star Wars for the first time with your mom and dad, playing with your friends. Like this has never really left us. So I think it's simply the love and affection we have for these characters is, uh, it, it takes us back to, uh, Christmas birthdays, adventures in the backyard during, uh, summertime when school's out and you're pretending to be a Wookiee and your best friends pretending to be a clone trooper or Han Solo or Luke Skywalker. Uh, you know, it's, it takes us back to happy times. It makes us happy. And the, if you if you can make somebody happy, they will love you forever, and that I think is what's behind these movies. Why they are bigger and more powerful than anything else. I think the toys are a big part of that. You grow up making up your own stories, and uh, you got a chance to not just experience them passively as a viewer, but actively as uh, a kid with an imagination or a parent who's sitting down to play uh, and be a kid again with your own child. That's a powerful thing, and no other movie or story does that. So that's my long answer. It's Christmas. Star Wars is Christmas. <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 something that gets to come around every so often and, and make you happy. I, I agree. Well said. And, and, and you're and you're right on. Of course. I mean, Star Wars truly is ubiquitous. I mean, grocery stores, malls. I mean, Christmas decorations. It's everywhere. I tried to explain to my wife, who's only a Star Wars fan through marriage, and even that is, you know, <laughs> passive at best. Uh, I try to explain to her, imagine going to the Super Bowl and knowing that your team is not only going to win, but dominate, and you're there live to see it happen. I think that's maybe one of the only ways I can think to put into words what The Force Awakens means to people. Sure, there will be other Star Wars films coming out. A lot of amazing experiences. Rebels is wonderful. The comics are wonderful. The novels are wonderful. But there's something so unique about this because you've got the original cast back. And I know you've been uh, having a great time and been very blessed. And you got to interview all of the amazing people that are a part of this film. And what is it like to interview them, particularly someone like Harrison Ford? <laughs> well, I, I got to have a, a great interview with Harrison Ford. Uh, but it was like back in, we're planning this big uh, Star Wars special issue for Entertainment Weekly. and uh, I have it. Yeah. So, you know, I was like, we got to talk to Harrison Ford. Uh, we've got to do a, a piece on him. Now, I didn't know, was I going to get a phone interview with Harrison Ford? Was I going to get, a, you know, email him some questions? Sure. You never know what you're going to get access to uh, when you put in your requests and you, you know, bang your drum and toot your horn and try and get somebody to talk to you. Um, so I put in all these, I put in these requests with the different, you know, representatives and all that. And, uh, we were getting down to the wire, right? Where the story's got to happen. And I talked to all, you know, the production designers and JJ and Kathy and you know, many of the other actors. And, the Harrison was like this big missing piece. And one day I was walking my kid to school, dropping her off. And I get a call. It's like, it's like 10 to eight in the morning. Right. And they're like, uh, it's one of the people from Lucasfilm. And they're like, Hey, can you meet Harrison Ford? Sorry for the short notice, but can you meet Harrison Ford at his airplane hangar in Santa Monica? In an hour and a half. Did you tweet that out? Maybe did I? That seems to ring a bell. Too. Later, I tweeted it out. Yes, right. Yes. So, and I was like, I live, I live more than an hour and a half away from that. You know. Mm -hmm. So I was like, uh, if I leave immediately, I will get there as soon as possible. But like, 
it might, I might be a little late. And I ended up being a half hour late for the interview because traffic is, you know, so bad. And, but I, you know, as soon as I got the word, I, you know, I didn't abandon my child on the street. I, I, I took her to school and came back. <laughs> and, you're on your own, kid. That's you right. know, uh, <laughs> uh, but it came back, you know, uh, you know, splashed some water on my face, ran a comb through my hair and jumped in the car and then, you know, inched along the 405 to Santa Monica. Very un and, Jones-like on the way there, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, uh, so, you know, I got there a half hour late, but he was cool. Like he understood that this was a last minute thing and he couldn't have been nicer. But when Harrison Ford, the thing about him is he's very soft spoken. In fact, uh, you know, for my own radio show on Sirius XM, we just posted the audio from that interview, which is, you know, it's, it's, it's a real life situation. It's not a studio. So you have like all this ambient sound. So he's talking to me and her planes taking off in the background. It's actually really cool to listen to. And he's so soft spoken and, and that it's surprising. You know, he very, he's very quiet. I, I remember as we were having the conversation, I was like, oh, my God, these planes in the background. I hope I'm able to hear what he's saying on the recorder. And um, I like him because he's really mellow. But also, as I was talking to him, I realized he is Han Solo. Yeah. He's this flyboy. He's this adventurer. He's survived all this crazy stuff this year, the accident on set, the plane crash uh, of his uh, World War II training fighter and, like <laughs> – He's he's the real deal. He's not as like sassy as Han Solo. He's much quieter, but he also plays by pretending that he's not playing. Like you know, sure. I remember I, I asked him about being young Han Solo, or about the the fact that this young Han Solo movie's in the works, and what he thinks about that. And he was like, oh, you know, I don't think about it. I just don't think about it. I'm like, come on, like <laughs> you don't feel proprietary at all. Like you've you've built this character, don't you? have any thoughts on it and he was like no nah, i've got shoes at the cobbler i gotta get this bike fixed this motorcycle i have a lot of things on my mind and like it was funny because like he just says it very deadpan but it's like oh you've got shoes at the cobbler so you can't think about this like <laughs> um i he definitely it- projects like a persona where people aren't sure if he's if he's just aloof or indifferent but he does seem to have much more emotion and excitement than he has in for a long yes. time and I would say this. If you're Harrison Ford and you've been going through this for 40 years, that is a self-defense mechanism. Is sure. Sometimes you are aloof. Sometimes somebody comes up to you and they're getting up in your grill and they're, you know. And they think they know you. They think they know you. They have expectations of you. They're, you know, how many times can you hear, oh, it's Han Solo. You're so awesome. I'm like, thank you. Thank you. Like, what I, I, you know, I've talked to a lot of famous people over the years. And um, one thing that I've learned from them is it's you know, this kind of energy and excitement, it's hard to deal with. Like when somebody comes up and just like gushes over you, the only thing you can really say is thanks. Thank you. Right. You know? And then if it keeps coming, like, you know, there's nothing, there's no exchange of conversation. Like when I have bring friends to a movie premiere or something, I always say like, when you meet somebody, don't, you know, you can say like, Hey, I I really like this, you know, movie. You did a phenomenal job, but don't like overdo it. Because they, there's, they don't know how to deal with that. Like, actually have a conversation, ask a question, make a joke. That, then, then there's an exchange, right? Yeah, and I think you avoid the meta communication and just talk. Yeah, you can only deal with gushing for so long, and then it's like, all right, well, this is all there is. Thing. I'm glad you really love everything I've ever done. Like, <laughs> you know, uh, but like. A, you know, bring up like, hey, I, you grew up in Wyoming. I, I I lived there for twenty years. Like, where did you? You know, like suddenly, like you have a conversation. So with him, I think the aloofness is a bit of a self defense mechanism. Like it just keeps people at arm's length. But you know, I I think he's very funny, and he jokes that way. He jokes like that, that with his cast members. You know, when John Boyega gets him to autograph uh, Han Solo merchandise, yes. you know, he acts like it's this big burden. But like, he, you know, what he told me was, you know, pretty soon John's going to be signing his own merchandise, you know, for me, so I can sell it. And like, <laughs> like it was, that's great. He, that's how he plays. So I, I had a great time talking about Harrison Ford and, it, you know, it's the second big interview I've done with him uh, over the years. He, and he was the same way the first time. He's very generous. He's a great interview. He's very quiet. So, uh, I got some good advice years and years and years ago when I was just starting out from this writer named Bob Thomas, who was, 
he was 24 when he began covering Hollywood for the AP, and the AP is where I started as a as a reporter, as a general news reporter. And Bob was at that point in his 80s, and so he'd been doing it for like 65 years. Uh, covering Hollywood, you know, there were interviews he'd done with Abbott and Costello and Bing wow. Crosby, like, wow. yeah, really, like, great stuff, like, from the archives from him. So he was an older guy, and I remember talking to him, picking his brain when I got put onto the entertainment beat, and so here I am, 24, he was, you know, 84, maybe 80, maybe 89, and he was like, you know, um, I just interviewed Harrison Ford for like this, he got like a like a lifetime achievement award or something. So he got a few minutes for a sit down with him, and he goes, he's very hard to interview because he doesn't like to say a lot. But the way you deal with somebody like that is you ask your question, and then if there's quiet, you just let it be quiet, and then they may fill the void. If you immediately respond to that quiet by filling the void yourself, you end up with a transcript that's you talking at the actor. So with Harrison Ford, like, it was funny, my wife was listening to that radio show we put together from the interview, and she's like, you take on his tone when you're talking to him, like, he's very soft-spoken, and he takes a long time to answer, and your questions are almost whispered to him in the same way. It's like you're talking in a library instead of, like, an airplane hangar. And I was like, she's right, but that's the advice I got from Bob. Uh, coincidentally, about the same actor. Like, when you talk to Harrison Ford, don't talk. Let him talk. Ask your question and then step back. And if it takes him, if there's a big, long 10-second pause, uh, he might end up filling that with something really great if you let him. But um, that's that's kind of uh, what it's like to, to interview him. That's neat. You know what, and actually going th- – uh as a high school educator, I've, I of course, one of the things that they teach you and, and is important to learn to propagate is when you ask questions, be comfortable in silence because so oftentimes people are not. So if I ask a question, a particularly poignant question, or even something off the cuff, if I wait long enough, someone will answer it just because they can't take the silence. So it's an interesting comparison there that you've got. I love it. Yeah, no, that's that's it. Yeah, you just uh, don't don't jump in. Right. And, exactly. uh, the, it's hard. It is. It is. It is. So um, I see our, our coffee is running low, so uh, um, I want to ask you a few more things before we send you on your way. Um, how do you respond to the notion that Star Wars is at risk of oversaturation? Uh... <laughs> it's tricky, isn't it? I mean, I mean, as, as Star Wars yeah. consumers and fans and doing doing the things that we do, uh, both as a hobby and, a, and professionally – there's a balance there. I think that's kind of a, an overall motif for life in general. But when you hear fans saying that it's going to be oversaturated, I think there are a number of pieces of advice I could certainly give to that, Ben. But I'm wondering what you think about that. Hey, it's Dan Z. And Corey Club From Coffee with Kenobi. And we are excited to let you know about the Star Wars card trader app from Tops. Yeah, Dan, you remember those cards that came out in 1977, the good old days? Well, they're back oh, yes. again. Yeah, so it's the Star Wars card trader app. It has them all, as well as fantastic images from The Force Awakens, The Clone Wars, Rebels, and much more. Absolutely. You've got your favorite characters, memorable scenes. You've got key moments. It's all there. You get credits every day for free from the app, which is available from iTunes or Google Play. Open packs from the cantina, trade with your friends, and enjoy these amazing Star Wars memories as you take your first step into a larger world. There are so many different sets to choose from also, and there's so many great cards to chase. There's special inserts, there's rewards for completing sets and variants. It's everything you love in collecting from a galaxy far, far away. The Star Wars Digital Card Trader Collecting App from Tops. These are the cards you're looking for. You know, man does not live by bread alone, right? Exactly. So if all you're consuming is Star Wars, I don't think that's a healthy psychology to maintain. Absolutely. You know, right. so and and I say that as somebody who is going through that, like <laughs> I um, yes, I feel a little saturated, right? I feel I joke that I'm kind of like I'm kind of like a uh, uh, bender from the Breakfast Club, <laughs> you know, like locked in the closet with a carton of cigarettes and being told by. <laughs> My dad, like, smoke up, Johnny. Like, I fought really hard and and really pushed hard to get on the Star Wars beat. And now, after you know, especially at this point, um, or maybe like last week, I was kind of like, 
uh, like how much, uh, you know, how much more of this <laughs> can I take before I can see another movie? Like, cause it's just been star Wars, star Wars, star Wars. Right. And I, and I, you know, I have a active Twitter feed and all that. And I think sometimes like I, a lot of people follow me because I write about star Wars, but then I think like there are a lot of people who don't, um, am I going to lose, am I going to lose them because I talk so much about star Wars. And I think right now, you know, I, I talked about Christmas earlier. It's the Christmas season. It's the Star Wars season. Now is when we're talking about this. But I would say, you know, uh, in terms of all the merchandising and all that, I don't need to buy BB-8 brand oranges. Um, <laughs> that's that's maybe a bit much, but that doesn't, doesn't really affect my movies. I, th- I, I My experience with the films, I like all the books and comics and toys. I think all that's very cool. Uh, I think you will enjoy Star Wars more if you also enjoy – some of the other things that are out there in life, including walks and companionship and uh, right books, <laughs> you know, like, like don't, I mean, now it's, it's, it's the holiday. It's, it's Star Wars. It's life day. Like enjoy it. Life day. Feast, <laughs> feast on Star Wars, but, but leave room in your life for other kinds of fandom, other things to read and enjoy and movies and shows to watch. Like I think, it's a scrumptious think, dessert, but it has something else for your main course. Well, or it can be the main course, but just, you know, sure. you know, have other, other things. I don't, I'm not saying eat your vegetables. Just enjoy Star Trek as well. Enjoy, you know. The, yeah, Civil War's you know, coming out. Batman Civil Superman, War, Marvel. Your families. Yeah. yeah, you know, there's just, um, I think if you feel like, don't, don't consume it to the point where you hate it. And I think there are a lot of people who are very casual fans. And, you know, respect that not everybody's, you know, a zealot. (laughs) So um, (laughs) so just... just, Can you be a jingoist and a Star Wars fan? Can we we make a new word? Mix it up. Mix it up a little, you know. And I think you'll be fine, you know. uh, I'll I'll give you another metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. Harrison Ford's airplane fell out of the sky (laughs) because there was a problem with the engine where not enough oxygen was getting through or the balance between oxygen and fuel was in uh out of balance and it caused his engine to choke up and, and he fell out of the sky so i would say make sure there's an equal balance of fuel uh, star wars fuel and oxygen in your life and you will have clear sailing well said my friend you should you should be a writer love it yeah we, we love metaphors at coffee with kenobi anyway so uh before we let you go we have five questions we ask each guest at coffee with kenobi to kind of find the commonalities we have and they're just really one word one sentence questions and then i okay. want to ask you about brutal youth of course so tell us, if you would, Anthony, your favorite Star Wars movie. And now you're the first person we've asked this to. And we've asked probably 90 different people this question. You're the first person to answer these questions that has seen The Force Awakens. Well, I'm going to say The Force Awakens. Wow. All right. Uh, um, you know, uh, this has been an incredible ride. I got to write about this movie. I got to follow along the production. I got to be a, a part of it or a passenger on this train at least. And, uh, you know, I have a child, I have two children now, uh, but one who's old enough to see the movie, one who's not, um, I'm going to be t- taking her to see it. Uh, there's an amazing girl character in this movie who is a- as cool as princess Leia, uh, and gives her another hero to identify with, uh, Who's, who looks like her. So I think uh, I'm going to say The Force Awakens for a lot of different reasons, although I love them all. Great, great. Well, we'll definitely have you back once we've all seen this, and uh, it would be fun to dive into it. So who is your favorite character? Who is my favorite character? Uh, uh, you know, I like music, so I'm going to say Psy Snoodles. <laughs> I think you're the first to say that. <laughs> And that's a fun one to say. Sure. Uh, it's not really. Like, if I'm being honest, like, I love Han Solo. I think he's the coolest guy in the world. But in the interest of mixing it up, let's say uh, size noodles. All right. <laughs> so let it be written. Your, <laughs> your favorite line of dialogue or film moment? Mm. Again, this is just so captivating to me because, as I've said, we've asked this so many oh. times. And now it, you've got a whole new uh, library, a lexicon to pull from. My favorite line... It's, it's in the new movie. Mm. Well, okay. can I say, can I say it out of context? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? All right. This is, I'm not going to say where it is or who says it to whom, but when you see the movie and I'm guessing all of you guys will, yes. who are listening to this, um, my, fa- 
the the line that has made me laugh the hardest in any Star Wars movie is a character who says, "You're cold," and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I mean, what can you say? So, Anthony, if you collect, what is your favorite collectible that you own? My favorite collectible. I don't. You know, I collect. I don't have any of the Star Wars stuff from when I was a kid. You know, um, I have some of the Transformers from when I was a kid because that was a little later on in life and those ended up a little better. I would say uh, if I collected, if I could have anything back, it would be that original 1977 toy Millennium Falcon. Mm-hmm. Amen. You know, I have a few, I think I have maybe a few chewed and battered action figures and all that. Uh, but, but, Man, I remember getting that as a present, and I just, I just loved it so much. I think I broke that. I broke that little. Uh, the radar. I was, dish. My, I was ahead of my time, you know. Uh, Lando smashed the radar <laughs> dish off of it in radar in Return of the Jedi. I think that. I think that radar dish. It may never have been attached to you the should, toy. Yeah, I think it I lost been sighted it by Lando. Yes, exactly. I think I lost it long. I think I lost it immediately upon opening the package. <laughs> <laughs> a new record. So, lastly, what particular messages or themes about the Star Wars saga resonate or speak to you? You know, I'm writing about this today because I'm doing a piece, uh, you know, right before we spoke about the rating, the PG-13 rating for The Force Awakens. Sure. And, you know, whether you should take your kids. And it's an answer everybody has to, you know, come to individually based on themselves, based on their own kid. Every kid's different. But I, I, it got me thinking about the, the themes in this movie. And I think uh, it, it, it connects with the earlier films as well. Uh, the relationship between uh, parents and their children is a important one, but a thorny one. And I think of Darth Vader reaching out to Luke a moment of kindness, like join me and together we'll run, we'll rule the galaxy. Like in the rejection of that, I think that speaks to uh, something that happens in every generation. Uh, Kids have to grow up and become their own people and they don't follow the path that their parents want for them for good or bad. You know, in that case it was good. But, um, the idea that you could have a connection with somebody but not have a connection with them is a really sad theme. And Star Wars is a fun, funny adventure. But I think one reason it has a little extra gravity in space is because it has themes like that that are a little deeper, a little more difficult, a little sadder. But I like that. I love that it's this brightly lit, weird funny galaxy but that there are dark corners to it yeah it's cinematic literature it's 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 the reason that ian desher was inspired to write the william shakespeare star wars books because they have those commonalities there and those those powerful archetypes that speak to so many people which is why star wars has lasted for so many generations can, can i tell you one quick story yes I go but like so a few years ago uh, uh indiana jones kingdom of the crystal skull comes out and i get a chance to sit down and talk to george lucas wow. uh for like an hour at the Cannes Film Festival, which is where that movie premiered. Mm-hmm. And this was the beginning of my relationship with Lucasfilm. So I, I was talking to him. You know, there are like fatherhood themes in uh, yes. Crystal Stall. At that point, I was uh, – I think my wife was – we were planning to have a baby, but I don't even think we were pregnant at that point. We had our kid the next year. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we were sort of like – it was. I was getting ready to get into dad mode. And so this was something I was thinking about. Uh, and I, I talked to him about it. I was like, I want to talk about fatherhood in your movies. And I didn't know what I was going to find or what he would have to say about it. Um, but, you know, obviously Indiana Jones with Sean Connery's character had it. It was in Crystal Skull. It was, it's all through the original Star Wars. And he was telling me, you know, I was at, like about his own dad. And his dad ran this office supply business in Modesto. You know, had become very successful at it. It built this chain of stores up. And he really wanted his son to take the business and, and, and join him. <laughs> and he was talking about how frustrated his father was that first George wanted to be a race car driver, then he got into a terrible accident, and then he got into filmmaking. And that was upsetting to his dad because it didn't seem like a real job. It seemed like another kind of crazy dream that he would pursue. And so his father was very upset with him, and he had a bad relationship with him. And the father felt betrayed that he didn't want to – that he worked so hard to make this business and that his son wanted no part of it. And it was, I, I can understand that, you know? 
And he was telling me this, and as he's telling me this story about his real father, and it was, you know, his father died, George was already successful, but, you know, his father kind of acknowledged that George had made a go of things, but, but was still sort of bitter about it. And, and um, as he's telling me this story, I was like, George, am I crazy, or is this join me, and together we will rule the office supply galaxy oh, wow. in Bacisto? And he was like, yeah, I didn't realize it either at the time, but that's what I was writing about. That's amazing. And now I look at it and see it. And I think the most, that's true of almost ever all great literature is like that. There's a deeper theme in it that comes out accidentally, because if you try to put it in, it becomes pretentious. But if it's just a part of you that becomes a, invested in the DNA of the story, like Stephen King and the shining being about a father who's afraid of being out of control, who's afraid his addictions are going to hurt the people he loves. And those fears come true. Right. Like, it wasn't that he sat down and said, I want to write about my own battles with alcoholism. It was like, I want to tell this scary story. I want to tell this space story. And then a part of your heart is just uh, imbued inside of it. So, you know, join me and together we will rule the office of the galaxy. That's given me a lot to think about as a dad and also as a kid who grew up not having the best relationship with his own parents. So, right. um, you know. I think that's what makes these movies connect is that they give you, they give you a good time, but they also make a little room for the not so good times. They, they make you think, um, and you can choose to, or, or choose not to, but, but there are certainly strong, powerful things there. And I think I agree. I think there's a lot of paternal things having recently become a father of my own. Uh, of, hey, congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool to experience these with them. And, uh, and you know, there are a lot of great commercials out there now. Saturday night live did a wonderful parody of collectors who keep things in the boxes and you know the lego movie has a wonderful theme about that as well so there's a there's a lot there to it and it kind of makes you sit back and think you know let your children let people choose what they want embrace whatever they are who they are because that's kind of what star wars is about really that's true I think it's absolutely true. You know, I, I, I got a bunch of toys from Hasbro because we did these videos for Entertainment Weekly, like uh, yes. uh, I, you I know, about, about the Millennium Falcon and Ray's Speeder. So I said, like, hey, you know, I'd really like to have the Falcon, like, to, you know, use as a prop. Like, is, is, do you got a spare one you can send over? And they did. You know, I put it together and used it for the videos. And we had uh, my daughter, and we invited a bunch of friends over to see how far through the original trilogy we could get before the kids uh, melted down and tore our house apart. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we like cookies and things like that. And we made an R2D2 cake and a BB-8 cake. And, like, so the kids were very, uh, you know, they were juiced up with tons of sugar. And, <laughs> and you know, as they're watching the movie, my, my daughter's like, can, can I go get your, the Millennium Falcon from your office? And, and my wife was like, no, no, you know, no, don't play with that. That's a collector's item. And I thought, oh, hell with it. Like, one, it's a toy. It's not a collector's item. It's not the original 1970. It's not some 40-year-old, uh, you know, antique. It's a toy. It's a new toy. If I want another one, I go buy it. Uh, play with it, kids. And they played with it, and they bu- busted it up, and they were flying it around during the action sequences, and they were fighting over it, you know, and like... I'm sure a bunch of pieces were lost, but uh, the the memory I have of seeing my daughter and her friends play with that toy is greater than anything I could fetch on eBay for it at any point down the road. So, yes. yeah, you know, it's okay to have a little collectible on your desk or in a little glass case, but uh, uh, better to have those memories. Better to have those memories, I think. Too. That's right. Yeah, it, it's it's so many things to so many people, and it's wonderful. Before we let you go, Anthony, you've been so generous with your time, and we, we really appreciate it. I'd love to hear more about Brutal Youth and where people can reach out to you if they want to ask you a question or just say hello. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm on Twitter at, at Bresnikan. It's a hard name to pronounce and spell, but it's uh, B-R-E-Z-N-I-C-A-N. And, uh, yeah, I wrote a novel called Brutal Youth. It's, uh, it stole the title from an Elvis Costello song. <laughs> and it's about, it's like a dark, uh, weird, funny, sad, crazy coming of age story about these kids at a, uh, at a crumbling private school that has become a dumping ground for delinquents and troublemakers and, and losers and weirdos and the unlucky. And it's kind of like this survival of the fittest story. It's sad at times. I hope it's very funny at times. It has a little Star Wars in it, you know, because it's set back when I was in high school in the 90s. So that, you know, references to Star Wars uh, 
abound. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that. Destiny. So there's a little bit of Star Wars in there. It wasn't intentional, but uh, uh, I didn't know I would be uh, on the Star Wars beat down the road. But yeah, it just came out. It's in paperback. And if you like, my brother calls it Fight Club meets The Breakfast Club. So um, uh, if is that sounds. Some, is there some S.E. Hinton in it as well? Some outsiders? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it was one of the writers who blurbed the book uh, uh, made that comparison. And, uh, yeah, I'll take that. That's a that's a tremendous uh, honor to be compared to that book. Yeah. You know, so it's um, uh, if you want to find it, it's Brutal Youth. It's uh, like on Amazon and you just search for search for that title. You'll find it. I hope I hope you like it. Sounds great. Well, we will certainly put a link to that in the show notes as well as your Twitter. And thank you so much for again for being uh, so passionate about what you do and, and giving your all and for sharing your time with us. We we appreciate it so much, Anthony. Have a wonderful Christmas, and we look forward to talking with you in the future. Well, it was fun getting caffeinated with you on Coffee with Kenobi. Uh, thank you for doing what you do. You know there uh, there are a lot of people out there who have podcasts, and uh, uh, you know I've I've been on a couple of them, and I love this because. Uh, you know, we're all in the same boat. We're we're fans of these stories, and uh, you know, sharing stories is uh, part of what makes us human. And so it's it's been fun to be a part of it. So thanks for having me on. Oh, pleasure. Thank you, sir. Chewie, get us out of here. From Tops comes the all new digital card collecting app, free to download from iTunes or Google Play. Star Wars Card Trader. For the first time ever, collect and trade everything from legendary 1977 Star Wars cards to new cards featuring exclusive content from Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens. All from the comfort of your mobile devices, Star Wars Card Trader. These are the cards you're looking for. Give the evacuation code signal. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. Move along. Move along.